Okay. So we're going to go through, um, I don't know, is this somebody's up here? Okay, so I'm chunking it in this last call. That's a lot of water to waste. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to go through the um, integumentary skin stuff first, and then depending on how much time we have, um, we'll go to the communicable diseases, and um, we'll look at how much time we have, and then I'll go f decide how much time I'll spend on each one as we go through that. But um, this is kind of, I think this is um, a fun lecture to go through. And sorry, I walk around, so if I get in your way or you can't hear me, just wave. Or if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and ask me if I need to clarify something. Um, I like to do this lecture. It kind of like gets you all itchy and <laughs> we have fun with this, with all the skin stuff. Oh, come on. Is this going to work? It does if I turn it on. There we go. Um, this picture is just for your reference. If you need to go back to it to kind of remind yourself of, you know, where is the dermis? Come on, is this going to work? There we go. Where's the epidermis? Where's the dermis? When we're talking about certain things getting down into the dermis, you'll know that that's below the epidermis, so that's an even deeper ulceration or scratching or it's a worse problem it can cause scarring and um, you know you can look at where your sensory endings are your blood vessels what layer are they in just refer back to that picture periodically if you need to because what you'll find with a lot of these skin lesions is a common theme is pruritus or intense itching um, that's associated with almost all of them and so we focus a lot on trying to help them with this problem of itching, you know, and it depends on what's going on as, and how old the child is as to what we're going to recommend to help with the itching, but has anybody experienced intense itching, like from chicken pox or something? <laughs> yes, and so it's almost impossible for you as an adult not to scratch, so imagine a little kid and how miserable they are. And what we worry about when we do experience intense itching and pruritus and they're scratching all the time is secondary infections, okay, setting up. And so that's a big, big um, problem that we deal with with the kids, with the itching, with all of these integumentary issues. So I gave you a, um, a slide on the different types of causes. You know, what could be causing these skin lesions? There's four main areas that you can think about. They could have come in contact with something, like a chemical or something infectious. Um, now, that's different than down here. Let me press my thing. Then this external factor right here, number three, causing a reaction like an allergen. So this up here... The contact with the agent caused some kind of injury to the skin, like maybe a toxic chemical caused a burn, okay? That's different than if you came in contact with something like poison ivy, poison oak, that caused an allergic reaction. You see the difference? Some people get confused with that. It could be something that's hereditary. It tends to run in your family. Um, or it could be a manifestation of some kind of systemic disease that's going on, like measles, chicken pox, something like that. Um, when we talk about different rashes and skin lesions, we tend to have a certain age group in our mind when we're talking about them. Like when I say acne, who pops in your mind? Teenagers. So this is just an example of the different age groups that we tend to think about and that um, the reason we think about these age groups is because that's the age group that's typically affected the most with these particular lesions. Like, for instance, um, birthmarks. We tend to notice them in the infants and toddlers because that's when they start showing up um, and that's who we're focusing on trying to treat them. Um, and uh, the same thing with atopic dermatitis. That affects... Um, younger children. As you get older, you don't have as many issues with that. With school age, we see a lot of ringworm of the scalp, but if they have pets, 
we see maybe some ringworm on the skin as well. So we associate that with that age group. Doesn't mean other age groups can't have this stuff. It's just that's who we're focused on when we're thinking about it. Now, um, I'm not going to read all this to you. Basically, you've got this slide, right? Um, so bottom line, what's the difference between kids and adult skin? The younger you are, the thinner it is, the looser the layers, the more susceptible they are to getting skin lesions, right? And the more susceptible you are, the more you're at risk for developing longer term issues with it, like secondary infections or scarring or some kind of chronic condition. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're dealing with children out there. And you keep it in mind not just for they're susceptible for skin lesions, infections, anything that touches their skin. Um, that includes medications like creams. You know, sometimes we don't even think about recommending over-the-counter creams to parents to help with certain issues like itching. But you have to think about how old is the child. You know, you don't want to be slathering on a lot of, you know, steroid creams on younger children because more of it will get absorbed through their skin because their skin layers are thinner. So keep that in mind and do a lot of education with your parents when you're um, teaching them about these different creams and lotions and things. And that's the same for any kind of over-the-counter cream or lotion. That's why we try to encourage them to use things that don't have a lot of perfume and chemicals in them on the younger infants and children. Um, and same thing as you get older, sometimes you know that irritates your skin as well. So imagine the younger kids with the um, thinner skin, more of it's being absorbed and it can really irritate their skin. Do you know what toxic erythema is? Any guesses? So it's an intense redness. It's like a super red um, rash. And there's different types. Like there's actually toxic erythema, which can be um, a trapping of platelets. And that can be associated with a certain syndrome. Uh, ke ke oh, now I, I totally went blank. Coplic merit syndrome, I believe, is what it's called. Um, We'll talk more about that when we get to the hemangiomas and talk about different vascular tumors and what kind of damage that could potentially cause. But they are more prone to just a toxic erythema or just a really red rash. <clears throat> now, if it's an acute type situation, the skin usually um, will go back to the way it was with just very minimal damage. But if it's more, um, if they have some kind of damage from an ulceration, scratching, infection, or some other kind of underlying vascular disease, then we run the risk of having more permanent skin damage. And that's why I talked about uh, the scratching and the itching, how important it is for us to do some good education and, and try to really help them come up with some measures to avoid this. I see that all the time. I see scars. Um, lots of secondary infections. When I was a school nurse, I dealt with that all the time in the school clinic from kids scratching. Um, and then if it's a more chronic disorder, then we run the risk of having more permanent damage to the skin. Okay. Um, now, if they're having lots of issues with skin lesions, obviously they're going to go through different diagnostic procedures trying to determine what the cause is. And one of the things that you want to identify right away is, is there something they're coming in contact with or are they ingesting something that's causing um, a breakout that they're allergic to? You know, I don't know if, you've, if any of you have ever experienced symptoms from allergies, but these Things can break out in hives or a rash, and they migrate. It's like one day it may be here and here, and then you'll look a few hours later or the next day, and it'll be different places, and the itching and the issues and the swelling and the redness just kind of go all over, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I experienced that once. I was um, actually allergic to my cholesterol medication, and I didn't know it at the time. So this was over several weeks. It just kept getting worse, and I'd wake up one day, and my head would be swollen, and I'd have hives all over, and the next day they'd be... You know, my legs would be swollen, and I'd have red blotchy spots. <laughs> it was just, and they'd migrate around, so it was really weird if you've never experienced it. Um, it can be constant or intermittent, and of course, itching. There's that good old itching. Um, so, you know, one of the things we want to encourage them to do is go to their primary care provider and see if you can get some allergy testing done. Try to identify what's causing this. What's anesthesia of the skin? What does that mean? Guesses? Well, what does anesthesia do? Kind of numb. So it's like a deadening. So it's actually a loss of sensation in your skin. So you can kind of, if you think about the definition of some of these words, sometimes you can figure out what it actually means. So if I have hyperesthesia, what is that? Increased sensitivity. Hypesthesia, what's that one? It's the opposite of increase, so decreased. <laughs> and then this paresthesia, that's actually described as burning or prickling. <clears throat> I'm going to pull it all up here. Okay, so I've listed for you some, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some possible things that you'll see um, when you're examining these kids or they come in for help when <laughs> you're doing your assessment. You want to look at the actual lesions and describe them as best you can. I'm <coughs> sorry, that choked on one. <clears throat> what is the distribution and size? You know, what are they, you know, just describe them. What's going on with it? What color are they? Is there stuff inside? Does it wiggle? You know, is it hard as a rock? What is it? And then, of course, look at possible external causes versus the possible internal causes. And I've listed them there for you. You have this slide, right? Okay, so I don't need to read this to you. <clears throat> and then, of course, they're going to um, run different diagnostic exams depending on what they suspect it might be. And one of the big things they want to try to rule out is to make sure that it's not some kind of collagen or immunodeficiency disease that's causing this. Um, things you'll see done is cultures, maybe skin cultures, biopsies, patch testing, and a wood light exam. And so this picture, um, I don't know how well you can see that. It's not fluorescing real well. But when you um, use a wood light exam, wood light exam, <laughs> whatever, wood light, um, the blue causes different things to show up in different colors. And there's like, I counted like 11 different colors that are possible to fluoresce on your skin. The brown dark spots are actually sun damage on your skin. Um, if you had like a fungus, it could fluoresce like a green color. Um, bacteria may fluoresce like a reddish color. So each color that fluoresces on your face means something different. And um, if you're interested, you can Google it and look up all the different colors in the spectrum that might be there for your, um, on your face. I think it's interesting just to shine it on your own face to see. It's kind of shocking to, you know, if you're interested in how much sun damage you have or dry skin shows up at different colors, you know, splotchy areas. <laughs> so... Those of you that go to um, get a facial or something, a really deep facial, sometimes they'll shine something like this on your face to tell you how badly damaged your skin is and what wonderful products you need to buy from them to fix it, right? <laughs> what kind of treatments you need to buy from them. <clears throat> a lot of the therapies um, we'll see are common, and it depends on what the actual skin lesion is 
caused by as to you'll get more specific treatments for that specific um, process. Now your book does a really good job in the beginning of the chapters going over more of the common treatments and common medications you'll see for those different um, things that I think it's chapter 15. Wait, is it chapter 15? No. Which chapter is the skin one? Anybody remember? And I didn't bring my book down with me. Anyway, at the beginning, it does go through some of these common things. And the same thing, I know chapter 15 is the infectious disease one. So it's which one? Oh. Okay. So just be sure you kind of glance at the beginning of the chapter where they're talking about those common things. Um, and then I'll point out if there's something more specific I want you to know about with certain lesions. I'll point those out as we go through. Now, glucocorticoids are the most common that you'll see used, but they can't be used for all skin disorders, so don't assume that you know, you can recommend this and they can go use it, especially if it's over the counter or something that's not necessarily the best option for them. Some other therapies you may see used is laser therapy, all these things. Chemical cautery, ultraviolet therapy, it just depends on what's going on. And of course, there's a lot of different acne therapies out there, right? How many times do you see some kind of infomercial on TV for the latest and greatest acne therapy? Acne therapy. <laughs> can't speak, uh, medication. So when would it be appropriate to apply heat to disorders affecting the skin? Anybody look that up or guess? We usually recommend using cool, you know, treatments for skin lesions, but there are two situations where we recommend applying heat. So one of them is folliculitis. Okay. <laughs> it's, in, it's in there out here. Let me see if I can find it here for you. I'll go back to that. I think it's actually in your... Whoa, go back. I actually talked about it here somewhere. There it is, folliculitis. Right there. <laughs> folliculitis and cellulitis. Those are the two situations where you could um, use heat. Not in Pitago, but I'm just showing you how to spell this because somebody asked. Folliculitis and cellulitis. So we'll come back to those in a minute. Let me go back to where I was. Um, a lot of them use systemic therapy. I think I've already talked about that. Corticosteroids, antifungal agents. Obviously, if something says antifungal, what do you think it's treating? <laughs> fungus. So if you're not sure what they have, look at their medication that's prescribed or their MAR or, or the physician's order and you can probably figure it out from there. Um, so I've already talked about this. Relieving symptoms of itching is huge responsibility for us to help the parents and the uh, kids with. That's the most common symptom. And like I said, we use cool baths and compresses, except for those two things, folliculitis and cellulitis, we can recommend heat for them. Um, baking soda baths, soft clothing, clothing, bed linen, anything touching them may really irritate the skin and it could actually be painful depending on what's going on. Um, if they can keep, keep mittens on, put some mittens or gloves on, trim their fingernails. Sometimes the older kids, that's impossible to do, to keep little mittens on, but you do the best you can. And obviously good hand washing. Is there anything in nursing that good hand washing isn't recommended for? <laughs> I haven't heard anything yet <laughs> that good hand washing isn't recommended for. However, how many of you still are in a restroom, a public restroom, and see people not wash their hands. 
It amazes me still. And I'm not just talking lay people. I'm talking healthcare people. You know, I'll be in a hospital or even here, and I'll see people who should know better, <laughs> you know, not wash their hands. So we still have a long ways to go on education about hand washing. And always keep in mind family-centered care. That's really big, you know, especially with children. Um, we've got the whole family involved. And sometimes with these things that are going on, the whole family has to get treated. And talk about whew, causing issues sometimes. You go home and tell <laughs> the husband and the older siblings that you've got to take this medication because your little brother here has, you know, um, ringworm or pinworms or pediculosis. It doesn't go over real well sometimes. And everybody has to stop what they're doing and let's, we have to clean the whole house and try to get rid of this before we get reinfected. So you have to keep that in mind. <coughs> you also have to keep in mind who's visiting the house or grandparents visiting that possibly could be infected and reinfecting everybody. <laughs> or are they going to stay with some at somebody's house over the weekend, having a sleepover? You know, you got to really do some digging and some investigation to see what's going on to help them. Okay, let's talk about birthmarks. These are vascular anomalies, um, also called hemangiomas. And they're tumors, and they can occur anywhere on the body. There's vascular tumors and vascular malformations, and we're going to talk about the more common vascular tumors. Um, they're rarely visible when the baby's first born. They do grow very rapidly during the first five to six months of the baby's life. And the most growth actually happens in the first three months. But it can continue to grow over until they're six months old. And most of the growth is done by six months. But it's very scary watching this very visible tumor growing because where it tends to grow is on the face. So wouldn't that be very scary to you if you suddenly saw this thing growing on your baby's face? It's very scary. It's very visible. What other, what other implications would this have if it's very visible? What kind of psychosocial implications would this have? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, people coming to visit the baby, what are they going to say? Ooh. You know, what else? <laughs> Bonding issues, you know, like what's going on with my baby? Or, you know, people coming over to visit and they're freaking out, wondering what's going on. You know, and people are weird. Some people may think it's something contagious. You know, people are weird. They'll act like that. And can you really blame people in our society? They, they are, there are so many things that are contagious that we've developed this phenomenon of paranoia about almost everything. You know, we can't help it because there is so much out there that's potentially contagious or harmful. Now, the cool thing about these is that they will involute over time. So what does involution mean? What do I mean by that? Involute means it's going to go back over on itself. It's going to start shrinking and turn gray and kind of shrink back into itself. Now, it's probably not going to completely disappear. When they get older, they're probably going to have to have some kind of um, cosmetic surgery if it's in a very visible place and it's bothering them or it doesn't look good. But it will involute over time. However, you know, it, it grew very rapidly in the first six months, but it's going to involute and slowly disappear from five to nine years. So that's pretty much a giant portion of their childhood. So you've got this thing on the face, and yes, it's slowly involuting, but what are the implications for the child? Going to school, going out in public, yeah, a lot of, um, you know, what's going on, like, there could be some issues with their, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> their self-image. You said ugly baby. 
What do you think kids are going to do at school? Kids are cruel. They're going to call them names, make fun of them. I'm sorry, but I hope you weren't that kind of kid when you were in school, but it's true, right? It's just a natural process of childhood, and we teach them right from wrong um, as they grow up. So what they might do is they may go ahead and start different treatments earlier, depending on how visible this defect is and how bothersome it is for the child. You know, they may start doing some cosmetic type things earlier on instead of waiting for it to finish its involution. They'll be working on it all along. Um, some of them can be destructive to the skin. They can cause ulcerations. Um, it just depends on how big it is, what area it's growing in. You know, it could be if it's over the eyelid, it could be pressing on the eyeball, so they'll actually start treatment before it even finishes growing. They'll try to start some treatment then and get that, uh, keep it from causing further destruction. <clears throat> Mangiomas are the most common vascular tumor and there's two types. There's infantile and congenital. So congenital is very rare. So I'm not even going to talk about congenital. I'm just going to talk about the infantile type. And they suggest calling them infantile hemangiomas. Um, you may have call, heard them referred to as strawberry or capillary hemangiomas. This is just a little picture of one. Bless you. And what it is, it's trapped capillaries. That's what that is right there underneath the skin. Um, you can have a different, different types. Classifications have changed over the years. The latest one right now that's talked about the most in the literature is classifying them as either localized, segmental, or multifocal. And so that's what we'll talk about when we're talking about classifications. Um, it's linked to low birth weight. That's the highest risk factor. And the other risk factors you'll see is female, fair skin, premature. And I've already said most of the growth is done by five to six months. You have a hyperplasia of the endothelial cells. They just grow. Um, we really don't know what causes it. There's a lot of theories out there, a lot of um, postulations on what could contribute to to this growth, but it does follow a very predictable three-stage course. And so the first stage is that growing that I talked about. And remember I said that most of the growth occurs in the first three months, like 80% of it occurs in the first three months. And then it continues to grow till six months. Then it goes into this um, kind of inactive state where it's just not growing, it's not doing anything, it's finished. Now sometimes that can last for a little while or sometimes it will immediately start into the third stage where it's involuting on itself and it's turning gray and it's shrinking. But like I said, that can last a long time, maybe as long as nine years. Here's some pictures to give you an idea of what's going on with these kids. So this is a localized um, hemangioma. You see that right there? Isn't that scary? That's one and a half months. Look at it four and a half months. And then when it went into the third stage and started turning gray and involuting, look how much better it looks already at 27 months. It's amazing. Now, segmental hemangiomas have um, different patterns. And so you can draw this on your own face. And it's pretty simple once you break it down to remember this. So your first one is frontal temporal. So that's these purple areas on the side. So you see it's kind of right above your eye and on the side where your temporal artery is. Can you remember that? Frontal temporal. Then maxillary is number two, this yellow area here. Right under the eye, right over the maxilla. See that? Um, three, mandibular, follows the ears and the mandible. And then you've got your frontal nasal right in the middle, right over the nose. So see, at first it looks scary, but it's really not that hard to remember when you look at it and break it down. <clears throat> now, 
all kids that have um, the segmental hemangiomas need to also be checked for face syndrome. And as with syndromes that you've probably realized by now, their name usually stands for the different types of things you'll see associated with that syndrome. Like each of those letters stands for something. So I broke it down for you. The H is where our hemangiomas come in. But you've got some kind of brain malformation or tear anomalies, cardiac defects, and eye anomalies. That's what the face stands for. Here's a picture of segmental. Here they are at birth. Then at two and a half weeks old and three months old, you can see the growth. Now, look at your patterns, your picture of the patterns. What would you classify this as? What pattern is this? So, does it follow this one right here? Yeah, so that is your mandibular. <clears throat> These are more pictures of hemangiomas. Um, what do you think this one is? What pattern is this? The temporal, yeah, the frontal temporal one. This is a localized one. This one is kind of, they really don't classify it. It's, um, it's undeterminate is what they did. There are some that they just don't quite fit into one of those three classifications. So they call it indeterminate. And then this is what you would call a multifocal. It's more than one area. Now, here's some nasty ones. A cavernous venous hemangioma. That's where the deeper vessels are affected in the dermis. It's a deep bluish purple color, and it's actually from trapped platelets. And this is that Kassebach Merritt syndrome. I don't know if I said that correctly earlier, but that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, most are very large and on the face, so they're very visible. There's also a lot of other things going on with this syndrome, if that's what it's from. And so it's not, the treatment is not going to be the same as you would see for the other hemangiomas. <clears throat> this is a picture of this poor baby that has, has that. Okay. So what kind of treatment do you think? We talked about it earlier. What did I say treatment might involve? So what? Possibly, but for these, is cream or ointment really going to help these? No, not really. Um, so with these, it's a lot of them will just go away on their own. And the treatment that we're going to use is to either stop further damage, like say it's pressing on the eyelid and it's pressing on the eyeball, or maybe it's going to cause it's causing some kind of ulceration we may start some kind of treatment earlier to try to stop it. And what you'll see is maybe some superficial laser therapy used first. And that kind of sets the stage for them to do different therapies in the deeper parts of the tissue. There are like five different types of laser therapy. I don't expect you to know all of them. I, I can't even recall all the names of the different types. But they all um, focus on different areas of the tissue. Some you can get deeper with that different type of laser therapy. So you may see different types of therapy going on at the same time. Maybe a superficial one and then immediately um, a deeper one going on at the same time. Just depends on what's going on. Yes? How prevalent are they? How common is it? You know, I don't have the actual statistics. Somebody have their book and look it up? I don't know if they even say it. They're pretty common. Um, you know, how many babies have you seen born with birthmarks? We call them birthmarks. There's quite a few birthmarks out there. Um, a lot of them are on the face, but not necessarily just on the face. They can be other, anywhere on the body. And so they may have it, and it just, because it's not on the face and it's not obvious, you may not realize that so many people have it. But it is pretty common. If somebody finds that, yes? I know 
Right, right. These are vascular tumor. Okay. Yes, it's actually growing. Yeah. And these aren't going to show up right at birth. They're going to show up a few weeks after. Right. Usually they'll start growing, um, like a week or two later. They'll start growing, and then the first three months, there's like that real rapid growth. Is there ever any scarring like involved? Can be. Um, it's a bit. It depends. Um, we try to avoid the scarring, but the scarring comes from if it causes damage like an ulceration. Or, you know, we try very hard when we're doing therapies not to cause scarring, but there's some that if they have to get into some kind of sur surgical removal, um, we run the risk of bleeding and scarring with that. Now, the Hemangioma Foundation has a, um, a mission to try to educate physicians on how to treat these because there's not that many physicians familiar with how to treat hemangiomas. I mean, there's the fear that there'll be a lot of bleeding, they'll bleed out, um, they'll cause damage like scarring. Uh, so they're trying to educate physicians on how to treat this and then pass that education on to families so that they don't think that they have to travel hundreds of miles to find this one little surgeon that's expensive to treat their child. There's actually probably more out there than you're aware of. And so we work closely with um, the foundations and the local resources trying to help these families find help and figure out who's qualified to do surgery if they need it or what kind of treatment do they need for them. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so nursing care, I think we talked about some of this, it's very visible if it's on the face. It's very scary. Um, other than that, what's going on with the baby that you would, are there any other issues going on with the baby that would need care necessarily? Not really, it's just this you know, visible things. So it's a lot of psychosocial issue. And yes, there are some, tr when treatment is going on, we need to work with them on that. If there's some um, relief that needs to happen with them. But it's more dealing with family or strangers, people that see their baby, you know. People will come up to them. I've had people say, you know, I'll be in the grocery store and somebody will come up to me and say, I'm so sorry for you. I'm praying for you. Like, they're like, well, that's nice, but um, I didn't. <laughs> you know, like, it's almost offensive sometimes. People mean well, but they have to think about, you know, what are they saying to people? Is that appropriate or not appropriate? They're like, that's a total stranger. I don't know who you are. What are you praying for? What are you praying about? That's okay. I'm, you know, I love prayer, but, you know, what are you praying for? <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is it? So anyway, just be aware of that and, and they need lots of support. So some support groups. Hook them up with some resources in the area. Okay, let's move on. Um, any questions about that before I move on to skin infections? So what are some signs and symptoms of skin infections? If you saw this, somebody describe this to me. What would you be looking for if you suspected an infection? Somebody back there, what would you say? In the gray sweatshirt. <laughs> Dark gray. <laughs> we'll be going to look each other. <laughs> Any guesses? I can't hear you. Edema. That's good. Any, like, pus? Yeah, is there anything in it, like pus or any other fluid? What else? Warmth? Is it warm? What does it look like right here? What color is it? It's red. Um, how about smell? Is it smelly? You know, because you think of infections, they can be very smelly. Is it sloughing off skin? You know? Um, is it causing any ulcerations? Is it just in one little 
pet or is there groups? You know, what is the distribution of it? So, what about other signs and symptoms of infection? Like, has it gone systemic? You, yeah, so we don't think just superficial. We want to look systemically also. So you look to see are there signs and symptoms that the child's showing they have fever or some kind of infection. Have they been exposed to something, someone else that was sick, like chicken pox or something? Let's talk about bacterial infections. Who's at risk? Who's at greater risk? How about age of kids? Who's at greater risk? Which age group? Obviously, the younger, the greater risk they are. Um, and then if they're immunocompromised in any way, whether that's because they're taking some kind of medication that's causing them to be that way, or they have some kind of condition that causes them to be immunocompromised, they're at great, greater risk. <clears throat> So your most common bacterial types are the impetigo, that's always fun, folliculitis, and cellulitis. And then you've got um, impetigo is caused by staph. Um, all of these things like this folliculitis, these are also staph. Now, do you know the difference between a furnuncle and a carbuncle? <laughs> we call them boils. Um, folliculitis simply is an infection in the hair shaft. And so it doesn't go deep. If you have a fur knuckle, which it turns into a boil, that mean, means the folliculitis has gone deeper and it changes names. Okay, And then a carbuncle just means multiple boils. So these can be very painful. Um, they need some kind of treatment, probably um, they need to go to the physician, their caretaker, and get some, some treatment, not just over-the-counter stuff or not just heat. They need something else. Um, cellulitis, what can that be caused from? Here's, I know we've got stress, staff, and influenza, but usually what else has happened to the person before cellulitis shows up? You guess it? Usually some kind of injury has happened to the skin and to that area. Um, impetigo, oh boy, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> so this is classic. I don't want you to forget this. The hallmark lesion is this heavy honey-colored crust. It's a lesion that ruptures and the exudate has this honey colored crust and I've got great pictures to show you. As a school nurse, school nurse I cannot tell you how many of these honey colored crust things I saw. <laughs> it was like a daily thing I saw them because kids scratch, it busts, it forms this crust, it spreads, they have it under their fingernails, it, they like to spread it around, it's fun. Um, Here's some nice pictures. So you've got this little spot on the nose. Doesn't, doesn't look too bad, right? Then it keeps growing, looking nastier and nastier. And then you start seeing it bust open. And then um, before you know it, it's spread. <laughs> so if you saw this, what do you think needs to happen? First off, let's see if the kid's picking at it or scratching it. Lots of good hand washing. Okay, You don't want them to keep picking at it and getting a secondary infection and continuing to let it just get worse and worse. Um, we need to just keep it clean and dry. Now, if it's really severe, they may have to get something else prescribed for them. But typically, keeping it clean and dry, maybe some, um, I don't know, they, they may prescribe some creams. They may not. Just depends. Yes? So why, why the ginger and violet? 
Okay, so um, that like that's like a um, what do you call that? A horribly stained the skin. I yeah. I was like a firm believer. Yeah. So was my hand. Yeah, and did it work? I don't know, but it was, <laughs> it was like having a strawberry imagine on your face for two weeks. I know. Good. So what you're gonna see is that's a great example of like home remedies that you'll oh. see used. Sometimes they work. And sometimes they don't. Um, if it worked, great. But then what did it do to you? It scarred you for life, obviously. <laughs> so I don't know about the psycho so psychological implications of that. You'll see some treatments out there that do work. Um, and, you know, we have to be very careful. If we know some, like, home therapies that have worked, if the research and they're talked about, that's okay maybe for us to talk about and recommend to them, but you have to be very careful what you're recommended to people. Yes? If the child wasn't scratching at them, would it spread on its own? It probably, not as much. Um, it probably will continue to spread because it's going to eventually burst and cause that honey crust. Now, if they didn't wash their face and they didn't ever pick up that scab, Maybe not, but that's not reality. It's it's gonna spread. You know, who can keep their fingers off this scab? And <laughs> some of you may have a scab or a lesion on you right now that you can't keep your fingers off of, right? But trim the fingernails, clean under the fingernails, try to keep it from spreading. So here's some more fun pictures. Here's the first stage of the impetigo. Then that look, looks nastier. And then it's got the little honey colored dried exudate. As a school nurse, I tell you, I could not eat honey for years. <laughs> I just couldn't. And I have to take a break from honey after I do this lecture, too, sometimes. So it's just the idea. <clears throat> so um, I think we've talked about some of the treatment and the nursing considerations to think about. If you see this, I always send them to the doctor because they need to be seen by the doctor to get this infection looked at to see if they need a prescription. Um, once kids are treated with these things for 24 hours, whatever it is, they can usually come back to school, but schools have very specific guidelines as to what it is and when they can come back to school. And I actually have some posters up in my office I'll bring down at break that you're welcome to take with you and it lists all these things saying if they have to be excluded from school or not and when can they come back. And so if you happen to be at a school or a daycare center that doesn't have this poster, feel free to share it and I have more. You can always come back and get more. Next semester you'll be, you'll have the privilege of probably seeing a lot of this stuff when you're in communities because I think many of you will be in a school setting and you May not, all of you may not be in an elementary type setting, but several of you will be, where you'll get to see a lot of this stuff come through the school clinic. Okay, folliculitis, we talked about this earlier. It's an infection of the hair shaft. <clears throat> and it just kind of looks like a little pimple, right? You've probably seen them. They're very common. Where do you think they occur the most? What? They like, like, wet, sweaty places, um, clogged pores, you know. Um, we refer to biker's butt because bikers tend to get them <laughs> because um, they'll go on a bike ride, get all sweaty on their bottom, and instead of immediately changing clothes and taking a shower and washing it off, they take a break and rehydrate and it may be a while before they take a shower. That's just an example of what they get is bikers butt. And I'm not going to ask you to show a show of hands if you've ever experienced that. But if you've experienced any kind of sports, you may have had the privilege of experiencing that. Um, let me finish this. Cellulitis. Remember I was talking about it earlier. These are pictures and examples of what cellulitis might look like. Okay, before I talk about candida, let's take a quick break. 
Um, you want to do like a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll hit it hard. <laughs> No, but we are. <laughs> I think it started again. Should be going. <laughs> I'm going to demonstrate something with the rubber bands and then on your way out, if you want to post it, I don't know if there's one enough for everybody, but feel free until they run out. You can roll it up and use your rubber band on your poster. <laughs> if you don't want your rubber band or a poster, just drop it on the table and I'll recollect them. So once everybody has a rubber band, Everybody got one? So where's the extras? Oh, still passing around? Okay. Wait a second. <laughs> you broke it? <laughs> Some may be older rubber bands than others. Sorry. So put it on... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Y'all need it? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> and what about the... Oh, there's another one. Everybody got one? Okay. So put it on your wrist. And then start snapping it real fast. As fast as you can. Okay. That simulates laser therapy. So if you've never had laser therapy, can you feel, what do you think they might want to do <laughs> is maybe numb the skin a little bit. Depends on uh, <laughs> where it's at and how old the baby is. But that's a little painful, right? Okay, so you can keep it on your wrist. Maybe time you feel like you're going to fall asleep, you can snap it. But or your neighbor, if your neighbor starts falling asleep, just reach over and snap the little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and then if you want a poster, this is the poster I was telling you about. It's a communicable disease chart and notes for schools and child care centers. So I actually have a PDF version also. If you'd like a PDF version, just let me know and I'll be happy to post it. But feel free to take one, roll it up, use your rubber band on it. All right. So let's move on to talking about Candida. So um, who gets it? Well, obviously, I've got the answer right there. But actually, anybody can get it, right? Adults, anybody. Um, so newborns tend to have it. What do we call it when we see it in newborns? Do you remember from labor and delivery? Thrush, yeah. And where do we tend to see thrush? In the mouth. That's where we tend to first identify that something's going on. Um, it's a yeast-like fungus. There's normal flora is altered. It's fungal. Okay. So you do have some 
fungus on you that's normal bacteria, but this one has been altered, and so it's caused an infection. Um, it can be in the mouth and diaper area on the babies. It can also be systemic. And so when it's systemic, it's not only in the mouth. If you see thrush in the mouth, it's probably all the way down the GI tract. And so what are the implications for that? Is the baby going to want to eat? Or that person? It doesn't have to be a baby. Older kids can have it too, or older people can have it. Um, it occurs, we see it a lot after people have been on antibiotics or by poor hand washing, or if it's in the case of a newborn, maybe um, they're breastfeeding or something, they're passing it back and forth between mom and baby, you know, or if the baby has it in his mouth, or maybe he had a yeast-like um, diaper rash, and he got his hand down there, and he put his mouth, his hand in his mouth, and he spread it to his mouth, you know, there's different ways it can spread, but usually it's from touching, poor hand washing, you know, you want to make sure that if you're handling these babies, changing their diaper, wash your hands really well. And then if we treat them, we're going to treat mom and baby, because like I said, they can be passing it back and forth. Maybe mom had it in the first place, and the baby got it when he was born. Um, you know, who knows, or maybe it just showed up later and they've been passing it back and forth, having a little party. Here's a picture of thrush. So, I don't know if you can see that real well, the little white patches on his tongue and his mouth, and that can go all the way down your GI tract. Now, he doesn't look too sad, does he? <laughs> He's like happy to show you his mouth. <laughs> He's cute. You can have a really, really red tongue with no white patches. But they describe it, and I hate this description, but this is a description. It looks like curdled milk, but when you try to wipe it away, it causes bleeding. I hate that description, because just the idea of trying to scrape it off and causing bleeding gives me shivers, but that's the description, that it looks like curdled milk. You go to try to wipe it out, and it doesn't wipe out. Um, <clears throat> The candida diaper rash looks very different from a contact dermatitis diaper rash, like your regular diaper rash. The difference is, and I don't know if you can see it in this picture, is it's kind of a raised, almost a pimply type rash. If you see little raised areas, that is not your normal diaper rash. That is probably candida, and it's going to need like nice statin. And so we treat them like with an oral nystatin as well as a cream. And has anybody administered nystatin to a baby? Yes. So how did you have to administer it? What's the proper way? <laughs> you what? Oh, you did it on adult. So how did you do it on adult? On the skin? Okay. How about, did you give oral? Have you given oral nystatin? Yes? Yeah. So if they can swish it, swish it around. Or in babies, we take a cotton swab and we make sure we swab it around the cheeks. And then um, it doesn't hurt if they drink the rest of whatever that little amount is. Because like I said, it's probably down their GI tract as well. But make sure that you don't just shoot it in the mouth for them to swallow. You've got to swab it around in there. And then, like, you may have a powder or a cream, um, some kind of ointment prescribed for the diaper rash. So I've talked about treatment, talked about good hand washing, teach hand washing, teach how it's passed back and forth, and make sure that um, we're getting good, everybody's getting treatment that needs it. Okay, any questions before I move on from Candida? Okay, so we're going to talk about these fungal infections called ringworm, these dermatophytosis. I just love all these long names. Let's just call it what it is, ringworm. <laughs> right? I don't care if you remember the other. Let's just call it what it is, ringworm. So depending on where it is, um, that changes the last part of the name. The first part's always tinea. But then if it's on the scalp, it's capitis. 
skin is corporis, um, in the thigh, like jock itch, is cruis, athlete's foot is pedis. You know pedis is feet, so you can kind of figure out from the name where it's located. <clears throat> Here's a picture of tinea capitis. And it's pretty obvious, if you see areas of hair loss, immediately think ringworm of the head because other things that you would see like psoriasis or other things in the head don't cause hair loss. Um, this hair loss is probably, it's very possibly um, going to be permanent, which is unfortunate. That's why we want to try to catch this and treat it as soon as possible. They have to have something systemic. They can't just put an ointment on there. They have to go to the doctor and get something prescribed to take systemically to get rid of this. Um, here's a picture of tinea corporis that's on your skin. And can you see, it? you know, when you think of ringworm, a ring, and it's not like a worm living in there or anything. That's just what we call it. It's a fungal infection. But it's a ring. And you see this area of the skin could be lighter or it could be darker. But it's kind of a raised red scaly ring around on the skin. Here's pedis. You see it tends to like to live in these moist, warm areas between the toes. And it can be very, um, can be very painful for these kiddos. And so, of course, you know, it loves the warm, moist, sweaty area. That's why you tend to see it in athletes because they're sweating, they're running, they have their socks on, keeping it nice and moist. They love having a party in there. And then this is what we call from the jock itch. It can actually spread down the thigh. Uh, it can be from other things, but typically we'll see it spreading down the thigh as well. Okay, so how is it spread and is it contagious? Is it contagious? Yes, it's highly contagious. Skin to skin, people that come in contact skin to skin, it's highly contagious. Um, that's why when we treat the kid, we need to treat everybody at home. We need to try to clean everything that he's come in contact with. Um, and you see her hugging on a cat. Is Can we catch it from pets? This is one of the things that we can catch from pets. Okay, And cats, I have a picture of a cat because they're one of the biggest carriers of it that we tend to catch ringworm from. The cat may not show any signs at all. They may just simply be a carrier and they may not have any symptoms of the disease. Or they, if they're an outside cat, they may have come in contact with another cat or another area where a cat has been that had the ringworm and you just have to be loving up on them and petting them and you get the ringworm spread. I have to confess, as a kid I lived on a farm and we had probably 30 cats outside. <laughs> and so, you know, as a kid I had ringworm all the time on my skin. We didn't think anything about it. We, treat, we had our home remedies. I won't tell you what they were. Okay. They worked. But I, and I was shocked when I became a nurse and found out what? You don't burn a piece of paper and use the you know, <laughs> stuff on it? And I was like shocked to find out there was actual real medication that you use on it. <laughs> okay. But we do um, have to send them to get treated. And what you'll see prescribed the most is graciofulvin. I can't say it, but it's on your uh, slide. It starts with a G, that long word. If somebody can say it better than me. Go for it. Now, um, the way we diagnose it, usually you can tell just by looking at it because it's very distinctive looking, um, that round, scaly patch. But if they aren't sure or they just want to get a real definitive diagnosis, they'll do a little skin scraping. Um, they have antifungal creams. And if it's severe um, or resistant on the scalp or the nails, they have to have what I was trying to pronounce, this medication right here, this oral med. Now, when they are prescribed this oral med, there's some things that you need to think about. Oops, let me go back. Sorry. 
for nursing, you need to do good teaching because this medication, they're going to be on it for a long time. They can be on it like six to eight weeks. And so, have you ever tried taking a medication for six to eight weeks? Bless you. I mean, it's all I can do to take a Z pack for five days, <laughs> you know, to remember that last day. I remember um, a lot of medications growing up used to be a 10 day course. Well, how many of us made it the whole 10 days? So, lots of good education about how long they may need to be treated with this medication. <clears throat> if it comes back or it doesn't go away, they may have to go back for more treatment. And of course, <laughs> the poor pets need treatment as well. Do they like happy because they've been slathered in this little bath with this no. treatment? <laughs> they don't look happy. They're quite mad, actually. That cat right there, if looks could kill, he would like <laughs> take you out. <laughs> but if you suspect that you got it from, the, from your pets, you may have to go to the vet and see what kind of treatments they recommend for them. And then, of course, you're going to have to wash the beddings anywhere they've been. It's going to be a, a big spring cleaning in your house. Now, sometimes on pets, they don't need treatment. It'll go away on its own. But if they keep spreading it to you and to your kids, then, yeah, you may have to take them to get treatment. Any questions about ringworm? Okay. Scabies. Ooh, this is a fun one to talk about, too. Um, I'm going to have you all itchy by the time we finish class. <laughs> so, these little scabies mites, they only take 45 minutes to burrow under the skin. And they burrow into the epidermis. Once they get down in there, they start depositing eggs and feces. And that's what causes the itching. So, um, this can happen like anywhere from one to two months before you actually start seeing symptoms. If it's the first time, <laughs> you, you have a look on your face. <laughs> if it's the first time this person has experienced it. If it's not the first time, it may happen a little bit quicker. Your body may start reacting to it a little faster. But intense pruritus, intense. This itching is terrible. And it looks like track marks. In the track marks, it's because they've been scratching and digging at their skin. So it looks like big, long track marks on their skin. And generally, the most common place we see that's visible is between the fingers. They like those dark, moist areas. They can dig in. Um, the treatment is scabicide. And after treatment, it's going to take a while for that layer to be replaced on the skin. That's with any skin lesion. If you have a really deep skin lesion, I've read some of the research shows it can take two years for it to completely heal. And so when you have wounds that you're taking care of, those deep, nasty wounds that require wound backs, you know, once they look like they're healed, we have to do great education with the families and the patients to let them know that it's still very susceptible to injury because it's going to take a couple of years for it to completely heal. And so same thing with these. It just depends on how deep it is as to how long the healing is going to um, occur. Here's a little burrow. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's like a little raised burrow under there where he's dug in and made a little tunnel. Favorite places to live in your fingers. In your under your arms. Think of where all your skin folds are. They love those little areas that fold over and they can dig in. Um, here's another picture of scabies. Now, <clears throat> a person may only have like around 14, 18 little mites actually on them. And they may look like, I don't, you can't see it in here, but they may look like a little teeny tiny black dot on their skin. So they're so tiny, it's hard to really recognize that that is a mite. Um, you'd have to get them under a microscope. But the way we can tell is by looking at you know, those burrows, those red streets where they've been itching. That's 
that's what makes us suspect that they have scabies. And so how is it spread? Skin to skin. Um, we do occasionally have outbreaks in the daycare. So once somebody has scabies in the daycare, everybody, including the caregivers, probably needs to be treated and then they need to clean the daycare setting and they need to clean at home. Um, it's really fun when that happens, I tell you. Trying to spread the word and try, trying to maintain confidentiality of these things is a real chore. <laughs> you know, that, as a school nurse, that was one of the hardest things I had to do was trying to maintain confidentiality. Like, I have to send, send this red shampoo home with this kid that has pediculosis. Well, hello, how am I going to do that with every, without everybody knowing he's got the shampoo? And some kids, bless their little hearts, I worked in pre-K through third grade, and some of them thought it was a big treat. They get to take something home. It's like, yay, I have flies. I get to go. <laughs> They're like showing everybody. I'm like, I'm telling them, Mom, I promise I try <laughs> not to let everybody know. Can you get it from pets? Can you get scabies from pets? What is it called in pets if they have scabies? It's skin. Scabies. What do we call it? Starts with an M. Mange. It is a different mite than what lives on humans. So, yeah, you might get some of their mites, but they can't survive on humans. They can't reproduce and survive. So they'll die. Um, so they're not going to cause the problems on humans if you do happen to have somebody, that, a pet that has mange and you get the mites. They're going to die. Okay, so we look at the rash. We try to maybe do a skin scraping. If we suspect the scabies, they're going to have to have prescription meds. And there's this, um, they may have to have internal pills as well as a lotion and cream. And what they have to do is they have to like coat themselves from chin all the way down <laughs> um, with this cream and wear it for several hours. Um, once they're treated, after 24 hours, they can go back to work or school, whatever they, you know, need to do. Um, it depends on the policies of where they work. But they really shouldn't be excluded once they receive treatment. <clears throat> and the biggest problem is going to be itch relief. Even after they've received treatment, the treatment is going to kill the scabies and make the mites go away. So that they're not going to continue to, and it's going to kill the eggs. So you're not going to have the problem of them rehatching and continuing to burrow and lay eggs. However, it doesn't make the itching go away because your body's going to respond for several weeks to this allergic type reaction um, to the leftover feces, the leftover, you know, whatever's left behind by these little mites. Um, so we have to do all the teaching about maybe they need some antihistamines or whatever other measures they need to help with the itching. Itching, itching, itching. That goes with almost all of them, right? Who needs to be treated again? Anybody that's had skin-to-skin -skin contact with them? Um, they, any inanimate objects that can't be washed and dried need to be put inside a plastic bag for a week. Um, but if they can be washed, they need to be washed in hot temperatures and put in a hot dryer. Did somebody have a question? Okay, pediculosis. That's your head lice. That's what you'll probably get to experience next semester. Not yourself, personally, hopefully. <laughs> but experience pediculosis screening with the school nurse, okay, and helping them keep track of this because I felt like my life revolved around pediculosis screening in the elementary school. It depends on what area and what school you're in, what the policies are. But it was almost a daily thing because if somebody shows up to school, um, you have to screen the whole class. And if they have siblings, you have to go to their class and screen them. If they have friends that they spent the night with, you got to go screen their room, you know. And so it just kind of, it's like a snowball effect. 
if you reckon if you find somebody in that classroom that has it as well, then you gotta go to the classrooms of their siblings and, and on and on. So sometimes I was screening almost the whole school, almost on a daily basis. It was insane. So it can get a little out of control. So, oops. Lots of good um, education about how to prevent it, how to treat it. Once it's treated, um, they should be able to come back to school the next day. Some schools, though, have a no-knit policy. And so a knit is this egg that they've laid on the hair shaft right here. It's a little wide. It almost looks like dandruff. But the difference is, is that it won't come off like dandruff. You have to actually pull them off or comb them. I've seen um, like moms and grandmoms sit there with these little girls that have this long luscious hair and they've hand-picked their hair. I mean, it takes them hours to do it, but they've hand-picked all the knits off, bless their hearts, and sent them back just to make sure that they're all out. Um, just in case you wanted a picture, there they are, of what those little bookers do. Here's a life cycle of the head lice. So they're only going to live for like a month. So they don't have time to dilly-dally around. They've got to like get with it once they hit um, puberty and they can start reproducing. They don't have time to join all these dating sites and figure out who their you know, ideal mate is going to be. It's just like, oh, you'll do? Let's get with it. So, you know, they go through three different moldings as a, as a kid, as they're growing up. And this last molding happens 10 days after they've hatched. So that's not long. 10 days, it's less than two weeks. Then they're um, available to join up and start having a family. So they meet their mate. They have a family. And so they start laying their first eggs one or two days after they've mated. And that's around 17 to 19 days, and they continue to lay eggs. And the female will lay about four to eight eggs for the next 16 days after she's mated. And then she becomes an old lady and passes away in about a month. But then she's left all these kids behind that are going through the same cycle if we don't treat them and stop the cycle. So you can see how quickly you can get very infested with this. Um, I have this cool book that is all about life. And there's a lot of pictures from kids. And it talks about some of the myths. Anyone can get lice. You know, when we think about head lice, what do we tend to think of? What are some of the myths out there about who gets it? Dirty people, dirty hair. What did you say? Oh, something like that. <laughs> Maybe a certain class of people, but anybody can get head lice. It is anywhere. It strikes anybody, and it can go anywhere. Um, you know, maybe this athlete, I don't know what he's supposed to be there. Uh, she's screaming, eek, lice. Now, in the old days, it used to be considered an, like, a, like a good luck charm. Or like in the medieval times, you were honored if when the female shared one of her lice with you, that means you found favor <laughs> in her eyes. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, different cultures have different views on it. It's actually considered in some cultures as healthy to have lice. And so I have run across that in some of your older Mexican-American cultures that come from old Mexico. We've had to do... Dealt, we dealt with that at the school setting because their older people considered it healthy and so they didn't understand when they came to visit in America why it was such a taboo, you know, to have head lice. And so every time they visited, we'd go through the cycle again of everybody getting treatment because you're not going to break that. Are you going to break that, that belief? I mean, there's certain beliefs. Let's get real. You're not going to change their mind. You give them the information, educate them, but realize that a lot of times people aren't going to automatically change just because you told them this information. I mean, how many of your patients have you sent home and you told them, oh, you need to eat this heart-healthy diet, you've just had a cabbage, and you can't do this and this and this and this anymore. What do you think they're going to do the first thing they get home? 
They're probably going to drive through McDonald's on the way home because you wouldn't let them eat anything good in the hospital. <laughs> you, know? um, you gave them all this icky, tasteless stuff with no seasoning, you know. So um, we have to do the best we can and deal with whatever we have to deal with. Um, this is a drawing from a six-year-old, How I Feel With Life. And so what does this picture tell you? What does this face tell you? How does this kid feel? Is this kid happy? No. How would this affect their schoolwork? Distracted, itching, they're not paying attention, you know, they're miserable. <laughs> They may be getting in trouble if, if the teacher didn't realize that something's going on. Um, Over-the-counter shampoo is the most common treatment, and they can return to school, like I said, after the first treatment. Um, we discourage no-knit policies. However, there may still be some school districts out there that have that policy, and if that's the case, then we want to educate them about how to remove all the knits. Um, and then, of course, itching, that dirty word itching is an issue. And when we, yes? I'm sorry, what? Because once you've got treatment, because nits are very difficult to remove, and the shampoo should kill them. You remove as many as you can, and if they have to get a second treatment, they do. But you don't want to exclude the kid from school because they fall, fall further and further behind in their schoolwork. And so you affect their learning and their development. That's why. Because we've seen people spend several days, maybe a week at home, trying to get rid of all the, the nits. I've seen some parents get so desperate they shave their kid's head. Oh, that's horrible. If it's not a little boy, if it's a little girl. That's... But if they can't afford it. Yeah, they can't afford that. Um, and then I've also, you know, seen parents use Raid on their kid's hair, trying to kill it. So you've got to do some big education. When this kid came in with smelling a Raid in her hair, I about passed out. I was freaking out <laughs> big time. And so, you know, you have to approach them very carefully, too. You can't go, you can't go, you know, you can't freak out, like inside your head you're going, oh my God, how stupid are you? Why are you using radar on your kids? You know, you know, just, you know in my head I'm going, Ugh. but you have to be calm and educate them on why this is not the best way to treat this. <laughs> okay. Um, again, who needs to be treated? Same people if they've got close contact, you know, in the room. What are these little kids doing? When you went to the Head Start Places, when they were playing, what were they doing? They were touching, hugging. What did they share? That could, I'm sorry, what? Toys? Hat. You know, some of them have like little um, dress up things that they're playing with um, brushes, combs. I know this poor little first grade teacher, bless her heart, she came to me. Like two or three days in a row, she had this really thick, long, blonde hair. And these knits are sometimes kind of a clear, whitish color, so it's very hard to see unless their hair is dark. It can be very hard to see them. And finally on day three, we found the little boogers in there. She just was convinced. And she got it because all her kids are hugging on her. She's in first grade. These are little kids. They're going to be hugging on her, loving on her, brushing her hair, you know. So she learned some good preventative things from that, <laughs> that experience. And then again, you've got to clean like all the stuff that they've come in contact with, the bedding, their stuffed animals, the carpet in the house. It's a big, long, drawn-out, all-night process sometimes trying to get this done. Um, and then again, once they've had treatment, they can come back to. They should be able to come back to school the next day. Okay, any other questions about head lice? You're all itching now, right? <laughs>
<laughs> How many are resisting the urge to scratch right now? <laughs> um, then we've got disorders affecting the skin, like from um, some kind of ki chemical or physical contact, like contact, diaper, or atopic dermatitis, and we um, also call that eczema. So <clears throat> I'm going to play a game of name that dermatitis. So what do you think this is? Yeah, but did I give you all the answers on that? Yeah. Uh, but pfft, never mind. Then you tell me. I'll know if you looked at your. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to take out the sound. How about this one? What's this one? Eczema. <laughs> it's so loud. It'll wake you up, right? Got the rash. Okay, we'll cut the. Okay, acne. Did I give you this? I did. I gave you all the answers. Okay. Um, so, can eating fast food cause acne? True or false? False. Okay. So, there are some foods that people claim um, cause them to break out more. It's more of what kind of diet are you eating? Are you eating healthy? Are you eating, you know, a lot of junk food? Obviously, our bodies are healthier if we're eating healthier food, um, and that could play a part in it. Your skin's healthier if you're eating a healthier diet, so that all kind of plays a role. Um, can hormones affect acne? True, yes. They don't cause acne, but they can affect it. The same thing with stress. Um, it can make it worse. It doesn't cause the acne, but it can make it worse. And then how about should you shampoo oily hair every day to prevent breakouts? True or false? True. So what happens is the oil from the hair gets down on your face and clogs your pores. Um, acne may be worse in teen boys than girls because boys sweat more than girls. Is that true? That's false. The reason it may be worse in boys is because of the oil. They may produce more oil from their hair, um, from their sebaceous glands. So that's why it may seem like it's worse in boys. And it can run in your family. And then 80% of these people between ages 11 and 30 will get acne. And you can get it, you can continue to get it all your life. But this is the age group that we're most focused on is teenage Teenagers and young adults. Okay, if you get acne, the best way to put on cleanser is with a sponge. Hmm. False. Why is that false? It can like actually cause skin damage because sometimes what they have found is that people tend to press harder and rub more if they're using wash rags or sponges. So they actually recommend washing your hands and using your fingertips. Um, it's okay to pop white heads as long as you do it gently. False. Why? You can cause skin damage. Okay. Um, these are effective over-the-counter treatments of benzoyl peroxide, resorcinol, and salicylic acid. And can it be passed from one person to another? Now, some people tend to think that it can, but it's really false. It's not a contagious thing. A person of color must be careful using benzoyl peroxide. Is that true or false? That's true. So there's, um, I believe it's retinol. I'd have to look it up. But there is a certain type of uh, medication that they recommend if you're a person of color because this can actually cause a big discoloration of your skin. Um, People with acne should avoid non-comedogenic skin products. True or false? False. That's what you want, right? That means it's not going to clog the pores. And should you see a doctor or a dermatologist if store treatments aren't working? Well, yeah. You're going to recommend it. It's okay if they try the over-the-counter stuff first. And if it's not working, don't just keep lingering, dragging it out. 
you know, tell them not to be afraid to go to the doctor and see if there's other um, treatments that they can recommend for them. Okay. So when you're dealing with adolescent patients, there's a lot of things to think about, right? <laughs> What's going on with them growth and development wise? You know this. Self-image, identity, uh, role confusion, all this stuff. And so peer, you know, they want to be accepted by their peers. Appearance is very prominent for them. So we've got a lot of psychosocial issues as well as the medical issues of dealing with the acne. Um, a lot of teaching we can do with these kiddos. Any questions about acne right now before I move on to animal bites? I'm kind of flying through some of this stuff. Animal bites. What are your nursing considerations? What are you going to do if somebody gets bit by an animal? You what? Identify the animal. Uh, if you can, um, see if they've had their vaccinations, like their rabies. Um, how are you going to treat that bite? What are you going to do? Clean it very well with soap and water. Get to the doctor. If you can't identify the animal, you may have to go through a series of um, maybe some shots to help prevent rabies. You know, they may see if your immunizations are up to date. And do you want to leave it open to air or close it up? Which is better? Open to air. Yeah. You want to leave it open to air we, as much as you can. Okay. And of course, report it if you need to um, about the animal so he's not going around biting everybody else. Okay, moving on to other types of bites. We've got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That's caused by a tick in the Rocky Mountains <laughs> and also by wild rodents and dogs. And so we're not going to see that much around here. And that's you can read that little tiny blurb in the chart in your book, and that's all you need to know for that. Lyme disease, where, do this, where does this tend to occur? What region of the country? Kind of north, yeah, northeast. Um, not so much around here, but we still want to do a lot of good education about, you know, um, if they're going to be in an area where ticks are, you know, wear the proper clothing, checking yourself carefully afterwards for ticks. And we do deal with uh, people occasionally who have Lyme disease. So what does Lyme disease do to you? What system does it affect? Neuro, it's more of a neurological type problem. Um, they can have long term issues with this. They'll have problems neurologically where they lose function. And it's almost like they've had a stroke or something. It takes them sometimes a while to identify what's going on with them because they don't, you know, if they weren't aware that they were exposed to a tick and had a tick bite, then. It may take a long time trying to diagnose what's going on with them and they continue to lose function. And then some of the function will come back. It's a long rehab process. I'm, I've had a relative affected by it. And so she went through a long rehab process. And it was as if she had a stroke. I mean, that's how bad it was. <clears throat> and we've seen some kids at Scottish Rite also that are dealing still with some of the long-term effects from the Lyme disease. So it's nothing to take lightly. Here's just a picture of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, what the rash might look like. And here's your Lyme disease. If you do see this rash, it's a very distinctive bullseye rash. And you see that, you think, ooh, possibly Lyme disease and good some, do a good history on where have they been, have they been hunting, hiking, camping, you know, where could they have been exposed to, to this. Questions? Okay. Um, I yes. Uh huh. Um, you said that the risk factors 
Oh yeah. No, the child. Yeah. So the highest respecter is low birth weight, and then also the little girl babies. If you're a little premature white baby girl, then your risk factors are higher. Any other questions? Yes. Is going back to the tango, is that contagious to um, Yes, the fluid can be contagious. Yes. Yes. So that's why if they're in school, we try to keep it covered at, at you know, they're going through treatment, but we also want to try to keep it covered so they're not continuing picking at it, they're not spreading it on themselves and to other people. Any other questions? Okay. So let's move on. To communicable diseases. No, I'm going to close that. Now, um, I may not spend a lot of time on some of these things. There is the website nipit.org. So have you started looking at those modules yet? The immunization modules. There's six modules. If you don't have time to read through all of them, skip down to the post-test, take it. If you don't know that information really well, then take some time to go through the module. Um, it's it's worth going through some of your test questions might come from there some of those post test questions intent so it's worth looking at <laughs> I know you've got a lot of information to go through but that's why I want to just kind of go through and point out some of the more important things oh wait I opened the wrong thing here what am I talking about oh yeah Okay, so, oh, I got, I did not like go through the slideshow portion last night and I forgot about all the stupid sound effects, so someday I will take those off. <laughs> okay, so there's really three main groups of children, I mean really there's more, but I kind of grouped them into three groups of children who are at risk for developing a serious or fatal complications from communicable diseases. So what are your best guesses on that? I'm sorry, what? I'm thinking more like what's going on with them, not necessarily ages. Like, who do you think would be at risk if they were exposed to a communicable disease? Who would be at the highest risk? Immunocompromised. That makes sense. You know, somebody who's immunocompromised. So that could be either they're undergoing some kind of steroid or immunosuppressive therapy. That's one group. Something that's making them immunocompromised. Or they have an immunological disorder. That's a second group. And then the third group, they have like a generalized um, malignancy or cancer that's spread throughout the body. So some kind of cancer patient. Those are kind of big. Those are the highest risk ones that if they're exposed. I mean, it's kind of common sense, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're immunocompromised. But they tend to, it, when you look at the literature, they have that as a very distinctive group that's at really high risk. Okay, so here's the um, website I was talking about with the modules. It's anipit.org, and they're called Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunizations. And so... Um, it's the information is located in Blackboard under the self-paced modules. If you haven't gone there yet to look at it, please do so. Um, when we're talking about mono, what's the other name for mono? Kissing disease, yeah. <laughs> um, I was one of those lucky ones that had the kissing disease and talk about teasing. Because guess who else had it? My boyfriend in high school, yes. So um, I think when I go home for homecomings, they still tease us about that. Can you? <laughs> so it's a lifelong teasing thing, I guess. Anyway, um, what you'll find with some of these communicable diseases is that 
These bugs are very smart and they're very sneaky. And they like to incubate for long periods of time and do sneak attacks, like when you least expect it. When you're not even aware that you're contagious, you're the most contagious, you know. Um, they have an incubation period for like two to six weeks. That's crazy, isn't it? Huh? No, that's okay. <laughs> you have all this information. Um, and it's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Yeah, you won't necessarily have every slide. I just kind of stuck this in there so we can have some talking points. But with the Epstein-Barr virus, what else um, is caused by the Epstein-Barr? What do we tend to think of? How about your cold sores? What are those? Herpes. Yeah, your herpes um, complex type viruses like your cold sores or herpes. So with your Epstein-Barr virus, does that ever totally go away? No. So it sets up shop in the back of your throat, in your oral pharynx, in the epithelial cells. And um, it lives there for your lifetime. And so periodically throughout a person's lifetime, they could be shedding that virus just like anybody else that has the Epstein-Barr virus, the herpes, you know, virus. They can shed it. You may not be aware that you're shedding it. It's spread through saliva. And so people may get sick after they've maybe been kissing you or they use some eating utensils or ate after you. And it may not be that big a deal. They may not have like a big full-blown, you know, thing that would say, oh, I've got mono. They may just have like a little, think it's the flu or a bad cold or something. But you can spread it that way. Um, yes? If you are the carrier, do you only have the infection once or do you have the apps? Um, you really only have this big mono once, but you could, they say periodically since it's shed throughout that you might exhibit a few little symptoms where you don't feel good. You may just think that you have like whatever bug is going around or it can activate it if you get sick from something else. Um, it's kind of weird. This, it's just like something that's just there that we have no control over. Really, it's going to be with us for the rest of our life and you'll be shedding it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're immunocompromised, that's a different story. No, no. Um, just like your herpes viruses, they're with us until they come up with a way to, you know, there's always research going on trying to get rid of these things, but no, it's going to be there. Now, your, best you, your classic signs would be this high fever, a very sore throat, like they think they have strep throat. It's very similar to strep throat, very sore and swollen lymph nodes. Now the lymph nodes um, tend to be swollen mostly in the neck and back of the head area. However, they're not really tender or sore, they're just enlarged. Um, and like the week before they really break out with these symptoms, you know, right before you get sick, you kind of know that something's not right. Like you may have a few days where you just you're kind of run down, you don't feel that great, but you're not sick. You're like, but you start recognizing the signs like, I wonder if I'm getting sick, because I just don't feel right. And that's kind of what it is. They're very tired, they're very fatigued. Malaise is what that's called, where you just aren't quite yourself. You're not 100%. You don't know what's going on. And they may not feel like eating. Um, and virtually every organ system in your body can be involved. And so that's why I gave you this nice picture. I think it does a great job of summarizing all the things that are going on in the body. Like up here, I already talked about fatigue, malaise, loss of appetite, and the headache. That's central. Then you have photophobia, so you're sensitive to the, to the sun. Um, reddening and swelling and white patches in your throat, very sore throat. Enlarged lymph nodes, and that can be all over your body, but primarily up in this area is where we um, tend to see it. Uh, systemically, you can have chills, a very high fever, achiness. So what do you think they think they have? The flu. 
Yeah, a lot of times they just think they have the flu. Um, they could have a cough. A big thing that happens is an enlarged spleen. So it's classic for them to have an enlarged spleen. And these kids really need to go um, on bed rest and be very careful over the next several weeks. Like it can take six weeks for that spleen to go down, back down to normal size. So what do we not want them doing while we're waiting for the spleen to go down? Contact sports, yeah, anything too active or, or that will involve contact because we don't want to rupture that spleen. Sometimes the liver will get enlarged as well, but it's primarily the spleen that we're worried about. And of course, nausea, you don't feel like eating. Um, and then we do some lab work and we notice that there's an Epstein-Barr virus infection hanging out in there. So the difference is, like you may think you have the flu, but then you've got these really enlarged lymph nodes. You've got all these other symptoms, and it's just going on and on. Like the first week, you're kind of not feeling great. Second week, you feel terrible. Then you start getting better. The symptoms start getting better over the third and fourth week. But um, some people, I've seen it just linger for weeks and weeks, and they just continue to miss school, they can't get their energy back, they can't stay awake. So those kids really need to get to the doctor to be checked out to see if they've got mono and if they are anemic or what's going on with them. How can we help them? Um, but typically we just try to treat primarily the symptoms. Now, um, like I said, we're going to try to prevent a splenic rupture by encouraging no contact sports for several weeks. And we're going to treat them just symptomatically. But what you might see used if it's a really severe case or they're just feeling terrible and can't get back on their feet is a very high dose short term course of corticosteroids. They don't recommend that routinely because it really doesn't, it doesn't get rid of the virus. You know, it just basically is to help them feel better and give them that little push to help them start healing and feeling better. Now, acyclovir has been used with success in vitro, but every time they've tried it in clinical trials, it's really not that successful. So they don't really recommend acyclovir right now. Um, they want to avoid using ampicillin or amoxicillin because these kids break out in a rash with this. It's not necessarily to isolate them. Um, what we need to do, remember it's passed through saliva, so we need to isolate their drinking and eating utensils. Don't eat and drink after them. Um, don't be exchanging saliva. <laughs> and that's really the only type of isolation that you need to do for them. Now they're probably not going to feel like going to school for a while, so they're probably going to hang out at home for a week, at least a week. Um, any questions about mono before I move on? Okay. Uh, come on. Now, the CDC, some of these things I'm going to skip over if it's communicable diseases that are covered in those modules. I may touch on a few things, but I'll skip over a lot of it. Um, there is this great site on the CDC site for kids, but I think it's great for us. I, I don't know about you, but the simpler something is put, the easier it is for me to understand, and then I can start reading more complicated things if I want to. But just a basic understanding of what's going on with different diseases, um, this place, this website does a great job of that. So I recommend going to it. And if you're trying to teach you know, your kids oops, about that, That's a great place to recommend they go, and you can do some good teaching with that them on that. Do you need a stand-up break, or do you want me to keep going? Because I know that you want to study, right? Yeah, so I'll keep going if you're okay. If you need to take a break, let me know. <clears throat> so same thing. Um, with tetanus, I know that was listed on your objectives, and so just review the CDC database info as well as they do a really nice job covering it in the NIPIT modules. You know, 
Um, is this covered by vaccination, by an immunization? It's preventable, yes. And who do we worry about developing it? Well, obviously non-immunized people. But um, let's say they're non-immunized. How can they contract it? Where does it live? Lives in the dirt. You know, when you like get stuck with a nail or cut yourself or something, what's one of the first things they ask you? Or if you need stitches, have you had when's the last time you had your tetanus shot, you know? So, you know, they really um, saw the importance of it back during the war because you know, they developed the vaccine and they started immunizing the US soldiers and they didn't have tetanus like and die from it like the other soldiers from the other countries were. So um, <clears throat> tetanus is horrible. Um, you know, what does it do? What is, what's the other name for it that you've heard it called? Lockjaw. So there's a reason it's called lockjaw. It causes such a severe muscle spasm. I mean, it locks your jaw and it sometimes causes um, your bones to break because the spasms are so severe and intense. And it kind of goes like this and then you worry about breaking the back. Um, it's, it's not a pretty, pretty sight. So we really don't want anybody to not be immunized against tetanus. Okay. There are 11 vaccine preventable diseases of childhood and so that chapter 15 in your book does a really nice job of going through them as well as those um, modules. What I recommend is having your book open as you go through the modules and if there's anything you need to highlight or star or whatever, you know, do that. But I think once you go through all that stuff and if you practice the questions at the end of the chapter and at the end of those modules, you should be good to go. So then we've got communicable diseases that involve rashes. You know, not all of them have rashes, but several of them do. Rashes have been kind of the theme today, right? <laughs> rashes and itching. Um, so some of these you know. Chicken pox, measles, whooping cough, German measles, fourth disease, and fifth disease. So has anybody ever heard of fourth disease? Okay, so there used to be five diseases of childhood and they just kind of um, listed like fourth disease because they really didn't have like a name for it. And if you look in the literature, there's some argument about does fourth disease even exist. Scarlet fever was considered like the, the second childhood disease of those five. And so it's very similar to scarlet fever. Scarlet fever is caused by what? What organism causes scarlet fever? Strep. And so the difference is this fourth disease is caused by staph. Otherwise it looks very similar. And of course immunizations are crucial to preventing the first four of these, the chickenpox, measles, pertussis, and rubella. Here's your chicken pox. Now, chicken pox tends to start centrally. Okay, so it'll start in this area right here, just like this poor little baby. He doesn't look very happy. So, if somebody says they think they have chicken pox, look underneath at their chest, at their body, because that's where you're going to see the rash break out. And then it kind of spreads up and out. It can even be in their conjunctivae, in their eyes. It can be um, in their vaginal folds, it can be in the perineal, perineal area. It's, it's very, very miserable to have chicken pox. Poor little things. Um, they used to have chicken pox parties. Did anybody, I don't know if anybody's old enough in here, <laughs> okay, <laughs> to remember chicken pox parties. I don't know. Uh, we didn't necessarily have chicken pox parties, but if somebody had chicken pox, 
people were trying to get their kids exposed to the kid who was sick so they could get the chicken pox and get it over with, basically. But that's not necessarily the ideal thing because not all kids have a great run of it. You know, they could get very sick. Let's see. Um, and then once it breaks out, you're going to have this cycle of everything going on at once, all the different stages, where they may have some pink spots and vesicles, pustules, scabs. And when can they come back to school? When are they not contagious anymore? Any clues? When they're all scabbed over. There's not any new lesions. Okay. And so um, that can, they can be out of school for a while. Now, if an adult gets chicken pox, what do they tend to call that? Shingles. There are, yeah, forms of shingles. And there are um, what they call actual chicken pox. I've seen people um, get it so severely in adults where they're on um, a ventilator. I mean, it can be really devastating to an adult person's system and really knock them out. Okay. Rubiola. Now, which one is actually the measles? Rubiola or rubella? So this rubiola is the measles. Rubella is German measles. And the way I think of it is rubioli, it's the ruby, it's the real thing. German measles decided to rebel, so <laughs> because they wanted the name, they wanted to be known as measles too. I made this story up totally, okay. So I could remember the difference. So they're rebella. I don't know if that helps you. If you have a different way to remember it, <laughs> go for it. Um, now something that's like I said, a lot of these bugs are really sneaky. They hang out and see this is before they, they um, come out with this rash. They have a cough, they've got a runny nose, high fever, they may think they have the flu and that's when they're contagious. That's when they're most contagious. Um, and then when they actually break out with the rash, they're not contagious anymore. A lot of these things, these things are like that. They're most contagious when you don't really realize what it is exactly they have. So common sense tells you what? Whenever you see somebody who is coughing, runny nose, fever, looks like they're sick, what are we going to do? I'm going to back up. I'm going to say, I don't know what you got, but I'm going to try <laughs> not to get it. <laughs> and so we suspect anybody now who's coughing and looks like they're sick, right? So if any of you are hanging out, your peers come to class because they don't want to miss class and we're coughing and we're kind of suspicious like, are you giving me something, you know? Um, they also have this typical coplic spots in the mouth which is small red, I have a picture actually, with the white center. Ooh, I don't know if you can see that. It's in the side of the cheek. And it's red, and then they have like this little white center in them. So that's very classic for the um, measles. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> I kind of rearranged this slide than what's on your handout. It has the same information. I just wanted you to know that it doesn't go across. I thought that was confusing when I looked at it. Like, just because of Titus Media, it doesn't, I'm not trying to line it up. Do you see what I'm saying on your slide? So these are just some common occurring diagnoses that can go along with it. Um, and then some considerations that are really important for us to keep in mind is that it is very contagious and it's airborne. It, it spreads very quickly in air droplets. Um, anybody, that, basically 90%, almost 100% of people who come in contact and are not immunized with this will get it. And there's no other host besides the human body. Pertussis, what else is it called? Whooping cough, okay. It's life-threatening for infants. Um, if they do get it, because it's that horrible whooping cough, uh, they're going to need something respiratory-wise, some kind of treatments, maybe oxygen. 
Rubella, that's the German measles. Remember I told you? Now, the measles, the rubella, they tend to run high fever and they look like they have the flu. Whereas this, the German measles, they don't have a high fever. They may have a low-grade temp. So that's a big difference. Um, they, again, you know, they may not be um, contagious. They may not even realize they have it as long as, you know, many as 10 days before and after the rash. So before the rash breaks out, they're contagious. After the rash goes away, they're still contagious. Oops. Sneaking little bugs. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. You have all that, right? I'm not going to read all that to you. Okay, now, if you can't get the answer to this after what we've been talking about, you just need to go home right now. So, <laughs> so what is the answer to this? Mother brings a three-year-old child to the clinic for a well child checkup. She hasn't been since six months of age. And so what's the nurse going to determine is the priority care for this child? Update vaccinations. It doesn't mean that that other stuff isn't important, but we need to update our vaccinations first. Okay, that's a priority. Fourth disease. I already talked about that. These were the five diseases I was referring to that used to be considered the five diseases of childhood. Now we've got a lot more diseases to add to that list. Fifth disease. Have you heard of fifth disease? Those of you that have children probably have. Um, very common. And so it's transmitted. It's a respiratory thing. I um, mean, it can also be transmitted through the blood, but it's primarily re transmitted by respiratory secretions. And there's three stages. It, they look like they have a flu. Isn't that very typical for most of these things? Then this rash breaks out on their face, and it looks like somebody slapped the snot out of them. <laughs> it's terrible. And they describe it also as a, a lacy rash. So I don't know if you can see that lacy pattern, but that's very typical for fifth disease. And most of them are contagious the week before the symptoms occur. Do you see a pattern? <laughs> Okay. Now, all I want you to know about this severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome is it's congenital. Um, the T cells and beta cells are not working correctly or they're not working at all. Their prognosis is very poor. They need a transplant and they need um, like a bone marrow or a stem cell transplant. Preferably from a sibling if there's a sibling that will match. And if they don't get treatment, they die within one to two years. Um, I think they've got it up to where they can survive up to two years now without treatment. But if they don't get a transplant, their prognosis is very poor. Now, the cool thing is, is that if they get a transplant, obviously the earlier they get the transplant, the better the prognosis. But they say if they get the transplant, like within the first three to six months, they do very well. If they don't develop you know, the disease um, and reject the transplant, then they regenerate these cells and they do very well and they live up into adulthood. Now, of course, their prognosis also depends on if they develop any other problems along the way. Everybody, everybody's different. Everybody's body is different, but it's very promising. Used to, we'd say, you have this, you're probably going to die, you know. But now um, we've come a long ways in the treatment. Okay, HIV and AIDS in children. Um, I've got this great link that if it doesn't work, try copying and pasting it because sometimes the links get messed up when you transfer and download the PowerPoints. But it's just very simple. It's, um, it has information on this website for parents as well as kids and as well as for educators. And so I like to go to the parent and the kid page because it has some real basic information that you can share with them when you're trying to teach and also to help you understand um, what's going on with it. So 
what patients are at risk? Obviously, those that are young or born. Um, you know, we think of babies that are born to moms with HIV. And then we also think of the adolescent group that's at risk due to um, some risky sexual behavior. So the young babies and the adolescents. This is just, you don't have to copy this down. This is just some statistics I threw up there just to give you an idea of what's going on in the world with HIV in children. Um, in 2010, in North America and Western and Central Europe, there were around 400 cases of HIV um, kids per year. Then in 2012, that number dropped down to less than 200. So you can see if you are fortunate enough to be living in an area like North America or Central or Western Europe where you can get treatment, we're doing a great job right, in preventing it and treating it. Um, worldwide, there are 700 cases a day diagnosed in children, 15 years and younger. That's a lot. Um, in 2012, there were 3.3 million kids diagnosed that year worldwide. Where do you think 91% of those kids were diagnosed? Where, where they come from? Yes, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, in the total population, kids kind of roughly make up, in the whole population of HIV, including adults, they make up close to 10% of the, of the population. In 2012, 210,000 children died from HIV and AIDS. And 13% of the total number of people that died from it were children. So we're running in the like 10-ish percent compared to the whole population that has it. So it looks great over here in your developed countries, but it looks really bad worldwide, and especially in the sub-Saharan area. Uh, did my thing die on me? There we go. Um, <clears throat> we tend to think of acquired or secondary as how kids acquire it. Either a baby gets it because they're born to a mom that's HIV positive, um, or if they're a teenager, they've acquired it through sexual behavior um, and they've gotten it. Um, when a baby is born, they're going to do serological tests because the mom's antibodies will be circulating in their system for up to like 24 months, I believe is what, um, like that's a couple of years. So they're going to do serological testing. They're going to test them in a month, two months, three months, six months. And it depends on what the testing is showing as to whether um, or not they recommend continued serological tests after that. Once they feel like they've identified that the kid actually does have um, HIV, then they are going to put them in this classification according to the CDC. They have a classification where they follow them and they stage them depending on what their lab work will show as to whether they're progressing to actual disease where they develop AIDS or if they're still just HIV positive and we're going to monitor them and treat them and try to prevent them from progressing to the AIDS um, disease. They're at risk for oppor oops, opportunistic infections. And so, you know, normally opportunistic infections come from bacteria or flora that normally isn't harmful, but because they're immunocompromised, they develop problems from it. And the most common one you'll see, you probably know this already, right? PCP. That's the most common one you'll see. Um, like I said, they'll do testing. They follow the CD4 counts. And so I have a little demonstration I'm going to show you to let, help you understand what they're following when they do the CD4 counts. I need five people to volunteer to come up here. Let's see. One, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> 
because I know that we'll be here all day if I wait for volunteers, right? So you're a CD4. The orange is CD4. So you've got two types of T cells. You've got the CD4 and the CD8. Okay. Um, now I need five more volunteers. Let me see. I need what's the yellow? I think I've had enough yellow. So let's see. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I just think you're safe in the back. Okay. Just wait. <laughs> so y'all are CD8. So everybody hold the color card up. And what I want is for um, my CD4s to kind of group together here, but hold your little card up. And then you CD8, you kind of surround them and hold your yellow card up so they can see. So what they talk about when they're following the CD4 counts is they don't only look at the absolute count, but they highly recommend that you look at the percentage as well. And so let's say this person came in, they had their labs drawn, hold your oranges up, CD4s, and so how many do we have CD4s? And how many of the CD8s do we have? They're the yellows. And so what percentage is the CD4? 50%. That's pretty good, right? Okay, I need one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> and, and back there. <laughs> You're a CD8. <coughs> Ooh, my T cells are moving slow today. <laughs> here, I'll walk over here. One, two, uh -huh. <laughs> three, four. Oh, here, <laughs> five. <laughs> so let's see, that's, uh, okay, one, <laughs> you look like you want to get up two, mm -hmm. three, four, five. <laughs> okay. So my CD4s, hold your little orange cards up. And how many are there? So this person came back for lab work a little later. Um, so you're thinking, oh, sorry, that's what he was last time. He's good to go. But I forgot to check the percentage. OK, yellow cards, hold your cards up. How many yellow cards do we have? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Can somebody tell <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So what percentage now? You've got a total of twenty five. Twenty of those are C D eights. Five of those or CD4, so what percentage is that? 20, yeah, so a very smaller percentage, right, than 50%. Can you see the difference there? Now, why is that important? CD4s, what do, you, what do they do? Why are they important to the immune system? Do you remember what they do? They're like, they're very indicative of how healthy your immune system is. I'm sorry, were you answering? Yeah. Yeah, they like, they're like the generals. They say, hey, we need to start an immune response. They need to, uh, we need soldiers out here to attack. The CD8s are like the soldiers. They're attacking their infection. But they're just going to hang out, do their nails, sleep, play games, watch TV if the CD4s aren't directing them and saying we need an immune response going on. So, 
when it was 50%, that wasn't so bad because that was kind of a semi-healthy um, immune system. But can you see how this immune system now were weakened where a smaller percentage of this whole count and your immune system is much weaker. We don't have enough CD4s to get the immune response going as much as we need to to fight off the infections. And so that's the whole point of why they follow the CD4s and they need to check that percentage, not just the number. Because if I just relied on the number, I think everything's okay because it's the same as it was before. You see that? Okay. You can either give your cards back or keep them. I don't care. Yeah, so um, when you're looking at the numbers, if anything over 500 is considered a healthier, you know, and the higher the number, like up in the 2,000 range is really healthy. But what you'll see is HIV-infected people tend to drop down closer to, if they're over 500, they're considered to have a fairly healthy immune response. We worry about them if they start dropping below 500, and when they get down to 200, they're in big trouble. They have AIDS and they have basically, you know, no immune response. So the lower your CD4, the worse a percentage, the worse off you are. I've got a nice little um, slide here that goes through nursing care and things you need to think about. We want to think about preventing infection. That's number one, promoting medication regimen adherence. So the heart regimen, um, it's very difficult to follow. It causes nausea, vomiting. Um, it's very strict to adhere to. So you've got a teenager who's on the heart medication regimen. It's H-A-A-R-T. That's what it's called. And it talks about in your book, if you, uh, once you get into your reading, if you don't know what that is. Um, we have a lot of issues with compliance. You know, you've got this little um, kid who's throwing up and, oh, that medicine makes me sick to my tummy. I don't want to take it. You know, we've got to be creative in helping these parents figure out ways to get their kids to take it. You know, there's some studies out there showing what kind of food you can mix it with that will help mask the flavor and help with the nausea. You know, is there some other medications we need to prescribe along with it to help with the nausea if it's really bad? And then are we trusting that teenager that they're adhering to the regimen? Because if you miss a dose, just one dose, it knocks you down and sometimes you can never get back up to where you were when you were staying on that strict medication regimen. Um, we want to make sure that they're getting adequate nutritional um, intake like they need because they have problems with diarrhea and failure to thrive is real common. Um, of course, lots of emotional support and care in their community. I don't know what I do with my little clicker here. Oh, here it is. So I've given you a website that if you want to go to for additional information, you can, and a hotline that you can give out to your patients. Um, or if you have information, you need to call them about. And then, I don't know if you remember when this came out. I don't have the actual um, date on here. I was going to look it up because I can't remember how many years ago this was. Do you remember this story? coming out in the paper, reported cure of HIV in infant raises hopes. And what it was is this doctor basically was very aggressive with the treatment and started earlier than recommended before they were even sure that this baby even needed treatment. And um, they were very successful with it. And so that just adds to the research that they're looking at potentially more aggressive behavior, I mean treatment with these babies that we suspect may develop it so they don't have to go through this horrible medication regimen later. You know, maybe we can knock it out before it even gets a good hold on the baby. So there's a lot of promising research out there. It's just getting it to where it needs to be. Like, we're doing great in this country, but we need to get it out to those people who are still 91%, you know, infected.
Any questions? Okay. Best wishes on your exam tomorrow. <laughs> Email me any questions if you have them as you come up studying.